Welcome back to the Thinking Progressive Weekly Progress Report. I'm your host, Ron Rivers. It's October 11th, 2019, and this week we're going to be discussing China's culture creep. If you haven't been watching the news, China's been in the news a lot this past week, and really two weeks, uh, because of their pressure on American-based companies to conform to Chinese standards of operation, specifically relating to Taiwan and Hong Kong. It's a really interesting scenario because we're starting to see China's growth start to directly impact uh, U.S. consumers. When an American company chooses to censor themselves in order to meet the needs of an authoritarian regime, we can't help but be impacted with that uh, as United States citizens. It's a classic case of profits over people, but one that may have some pretty profound consequences moving forward. It's a really relevant current event and something I want to dive deep into with you today in in our discussion. So uh, once again, thank you as always for tuning in to the Thinking Progressive podcast. China is beginning to have a visible impact on American culture, and it's something that we should be thinking about. The last two weeks, we have seen three incidents of U.S. companies being threatened or banned from China. And in two of those scenarios, the companies quickly caved to Chinese demands. Last week, it was the coercion of the NBA when Daryl Morley, general manager for the Houston Rockets, had posted a tweet supporting Hong Kong. This week, China caused a major shakeup in the Hearthstone online gaming community. Ying Wei Chung, aka Blitz Chung, pulled off his Hong Kong protester style gas mask and said, Liberate Hong Kong, revolution of our age, during an interview on Hearthstone Taiwan's official channel. Hearthstone owner Blizzard Entertainment responded by stripping the player of his status and financial winnings. So if you guys aren't big into video games, Blizzard Entertainment uh, was Warcraft, Diablo, and Starcraft. Many of us who grew up in uh, playing video games in the late 90s or you know, early 2000s are, are fans of those games. And, and Blizzard was a real innovator at, at the time. South Park was also a casualty last week when their episode Banned in China uh, was banned and scrubbed from the internet in China. Creators Trey Stone and Matt Parker responded with, and I quote, like the NBA, we welcome the Chinese censors into our homes and into our hearts. We too love money more than freedom and democracy. Xi does not look like Winnie the Pooh at all. Tune into our 300th episode on Wednesday at 10 p.m. Long live the great Communist Party of China. May the autumn sorghum harvest be bountiful. We good now, China? But these instances are are just the tip of the iceberg. China has demanded that U.S. airlines remove any references to Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau as countries independent from China. They forced the CEO of Marriott Hotels to repeat the Chinese Communist Party's talking points, and Apple censured the Taiwanese flag from the keyboard for users in Hong Kong and Macau. Google refused to rule out the development of a censured search engine for China, These are just a handful of instances of China bullying U.S. companies. I'm not exaggerating when I say the list goes on and on and on. Now, China's policy seems pretty clear. The world will fall in line with the Communist Party's position or else. The problem for most Americans is that our core virtues don't align with China's. Most of us understand the value of freedom of thought and support Hong Kong's struggle for independence. It's just another instance of corporations valuing profits over people. But bowing to China is about more than just profits. It's an encroachment on our consciousness. It also calls into question if we're viewing this trend with appropriate foresight. Now, it's no secret that China is the rising economic power of the world, and U.S. corporations want to capitalize on their emerging markets. But what is and is not acceptable for corporations in an age of global cultural instability? Imagine an alternative universe where, through economic and political maneuvering, China's culture of censorship has taken over the United States. You can now no longer criticize the government, your daily life is subject to a social credit score that rewards or punishes you, and it's a non-zero possibility that you may be abducted by the government, sent to prison, and have your organs harvested. In exchange, you'll receive a more robust suite of social protections, The government ensures health care, retirement pensions, housing, and education for all of its citizens. A guided economy translates into less economic instability, meaning more consistent employment for more people. The trade-off is the only way you'll ever really make it in China is if you toe the line with the official narrative. 
there's no doubt that some Americans' material quality of life would increase under these circumstances, while others, like myself, might suffer due to political philosophy. How would it impact your experience? Comment below and, and let us know. But returning to the present, we can reframe our question. Do U.S.-based companies have any obligation to abide by American virtues? Legally, the answer is no. But every time a firm submits to China, it contributes to the slow erosion of ideals exported by advanced democracies. Now here we encounter a paradox. Corporations thrive in the United States because there is a comparatively little oversight for how they excel. Yet their growth models contribute to the expansion of authoritarian culture around the world. If we believe that China's authoritarian culture is a threat to global society, Aren't American companies that help spread those ideas through concession just as guilty? Now, culture is a weird thing because it's sort of a measurable consciousness. Its impact on each of us varies, but it's there nonetheless. It shapes our way of thinking, acting, and being. Regional cultural distributions ensure that your global birth lottery determines more of your destiny than any amount of work ever could. As progressives, we need to explore what type of values we will encode into our institutions because values shape our thoughts and actions, which in turn develop into a collective culture. Liberty and equality are byproducts of the Enlightenment age and have driven American foreign policy for centuries. Today, these values conflict with China's ethos of loyalty to the collective above all. And that's where it becomes kind of a little scary. The most significant opposition that China presents isn't military conquest, it's economic, cultural, and political influence. That's why a candid discussion about what is and is not acceptable corporate behavior in the present day is so relevant. In bowing to Chinese demands, American companies declare to support the Chinese vision of global ethics. Specifically, that the people of Hong Kong's struggle for freedom is worth less than the potential profits of bending the knee. Under a more democratized form of market economy, we could imagine a democratic solution to Chinese demands on US companies relating to speech and censor. The process would include public discussion and debate, planning and policy, and, and finally a vote. You know, we might consider thresholds to what is and is not acceptable, striving to maintain the freedom of innovators while hindering multinationals from prioritizing their financial interests over the global well-being of large majorities of people. The Earth is already an interconnected matrix, and progressives need to consider the form we want to give it. American companies already have more political power than any citizen thanks to corrupt rulings like Citizens United, and at what point do we say enough? Now, market purists might argue that that point is never that any restrictions to American economic innovation will surely backfire and cause stagnation in our creative potential. But this argument is self-defeating. If China dictates what American companies can and cannot do, then innovation will be stifled regardless. In a future where economic competition with China continues to be a zero-sum game, the purist is faced with a choice. One option is a democratized market economy where the American public dictates standards of behavior for our corporations at a national and international level. The other is a market economy beholden to a foreign power whose demands contradict our nation's shared values and promise nothing in return. Which is better? Now, if you haven't taken the time to research modern Chinese culture and economic practice, you may think all of this sounds alarmist. And, and I'll bear the first burden in saying that for a long time, I believe the China boogeyman was just another U.S. propaganda campaign. But what separates China from most other countries in the world is their blatant disregard for established codes of conduct. They just define being human differently than we do. Global independence is paramount. They intend to be self-reliant within the globe. International codes of conduct mean little to them if there is opportunity for advantage as evidenced by the United States' constant struggle with the country over intellectual property. But it also would be hypocritical not to recognize that the United States is no stranger to harming others for personal gain, as we saw this week with Trump's abandonment of the Kurds in Syria. As progressives, we seek deeply integrated cooperation to solve issues, locally and globally. 
And that's why the Hong Kong situation is so alarming. It's not just the Chinese Communist Party who believes in the suppression of Hong Kong's freedom, it's the Chinese people. If the world's second largest economic superpower has succeeded in creating a multi-generational base of support for its economic-centric view, is there any hope for cooperative solutions? A progressive Congress and White House would see the writing on the wall with China's expansion and begin the development of interlinking the economies of our allies now. A suite of international collaborative projects in the form of infrastructure, economic arrangements, and legal safeguards to protect against future dismantling. We can imagine continental construction projects with Mexico and Canada, for example, to develop networked green energy infrastructures, encouraging our allies to do the same. Investment in logistical technologies to make overseas and air transport 100% renewable and automated would dramatically reduce the cost of goods between cooperating nations. Progressives would ensure the surplus would be invested in the working class, using this opportunity to empower laborers around the world. Diplomatic missions to emerging nations would also be a, a top priority, highly incentivizing them to join the global cooperative and not to submit to the authoritarian monolith. Of course, given our recent history in the United States of really bailing on our allies under President Trump, uh, this may be easier said than done. The challenge we face today with outpacing China is that our system is simply unprepared to handle it. American economic activity is slowing, and the same applies to most other Western democracies of the day. To truly tap into the potential innovation engine that lies dormant in the United States, we would need a progressive project to reshape our institutions. I'm not talking about wealth distribution, although that's part of it. The progressive project needs a new direction towards systemic reformation, uh, new laws of property and contract, breaking the most advanced methods of production away from the handful of tech elites and spreading it throughout the economy. We would also want to tie finance to the real economy, ensuring that capital for capital's sake is diminished. We would reform our educational institutions and create a new constitution and a new bill of rights designed from the ground up by the people for the people. Now compare that vision to the present day where the oligarchs of the United States have been methodically dismantling public institutions for their personal profits. We have more freedoms than the average Chinese citizen. We can speak ill of the government and our leaders without getting abducted. But it's no secret that the wealthy live in a separate set of rules and laws here in the United States. Laws that they have created to extract wealth from the middle and lower classes. That's why I believe there, there is hope for the future. It took Americans generations to wake up to the reality of our circumstance. And even now, there are large groups of supporters who vote against their own best interests. But we did wake up. And change is coming. It may not be coming as fast as we like it, but it is coming. And we can see that progress happening. Eventually, whether it be in our lifetime or beyond, the Chinese people will reject the authoritarian structure. It's in our nature as human beings. It only takes one economic crash, one high profile citizen disappearing, or one policy like we saw in Hong Kong to light the blaze. It's my belief that eventually China and the United States will emerge as cooperative leaders in Earth's ascension to the stars. China's culture creep is only going to increase moving forward, and I'm not sure that the United States is prepared to deal with it. And while it may be inevitable, I believe that pursuing an alternative vision of society, one that maximizes the potential of every individual to best express their infinite self. The only question we face as progressives is, is how to do it. You know, despite our existing challenges, I still stand by my belief that the future is cooperative and that is our, our best pathway forward. So that wraps up this episode of the weekly progress report. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to subscribe to our channel and like this video below. If you really liked it, please take a moment to share this episode with your friends via your social media. Once again, I'm your host, Ron Rivers. Thank you so much for tuning into this Thinking Progressive Weekly Progress Report. We'll see you next time.